Honored to be up here and really excited to be talking to this community. Uh, you guys are all awesome, and I've learned so much from all of you over the last few years as a coordinator. Um, so it's, it's very, just very humbling to be up here. Um, so today we get to talk about optimizing event growth and shift averages. This is, this is an exciting, very exciting topic to talk about. Um, it's probably one of the biggest game changers, I think, in the events program. Um, and I understand there's different people in this room. Some people feel like they're struggling with their event shift average. Some of you guys feel like you're absolutely crushing it. And then other people, like Alan and I, felt like a few years ago, felt like you're maybe a little stuck with your shift averages or your event averages. So the question becomes, what can we be doing differently in the, our programs to get unstuck and take our averages to the next level? Um, I'll preface this with, with Al and I, I've been doing this a little under two years. Uh, so by no means we have everything figured out, but we do have some things figured out for sure. I actually ran some stats in the last three years um, we've taken our traditional event average from 7,000 up until you know 2019, 2020 to 13,000. So we've nearly doubled our average uh, event. Um, obviously, there's a lot of things that go into that, and the main thing comes down to just the hard work of our team um, and our leadership team. Uh, it's been really awesome to see the people that you know have really stepped their game up and worked their butts off to just absolutely kill it in the booth. Um, but Alan and I know that there's a lot of decisions that we've made from the top down and a few focuses that we've had too that have been you know, really integral to the program that impacted us as well. So um, yeah, so our goal today is really just to share a few keys um, on what we think has moved the needle for us the most um, and you know, bring our averages to the next level, so. Yeah, and for me guys, I'm extremely grateful to be up here as well too. You know, on my bucket list was to actually speak at NET back in 2019. I made it as one of my goals, so it's exciting to be up here. Uh, <laughs> and honestly though, you know, when we're speaking about today about optimizing event growth and shift averages, you know, a lot of that, the back end work is really done from also the Cutco Community and NET events program. So we really appreciate you guys because it makes our jobs and everyone's jobs here a lot easier to be able to do to grow those event growth and shift averages when we have that back end work done. So we really appreciate Dave, the Cutco events community, of course, uh, and a huge shout out to Josh, our you know mentor as well too, for you know helping us these last two years. I uh, can't tell you how many calls Matt and I would go be like, Josh, we're, we need help with this CSP and this. So it's, it's really nice to have that support system on the back end too. Uh, and honestly, Matt here as my business partner, it helps a ton. And, you know, I think both of us uh, paired up two years ago. We were like, well, let's see how this goes. And I'm extremely grateful to have him by my side. So uh, I want to make sure I start off with that. But we keep it really simple, honestly. When we first got together, we we're like, okay, how do we grow? How do we grow this events team from where we are right now, which is like 1.6 to 3 million, right? And the three things we identified was increasing the skill and development of all of our reps from the bottom up all the way to the top, uh, increasing the number of booths or shifts we work or events, of course, and we maximize our current key events by staffing our best people, right? So those are the three factors for growth that we identified. Now, the first one I wanted to start off with you guys is training from the bottom up. This is very, very important. This is the foundation, right, for building event averages in the long run. It might not happen overnight, but it is 100% uh, one of the best things that you can do for your organization. Uh, actually, funny story. So I started in 2017. This was my training, and some of you might relate to this. My training was this. Here's a script. Watch this video from Jason Jeffrey. Have fun. Right. That was literally it. I showed up to the events meeting from school not knowing anything, and they're like, all right, you're gonna pick shifts. And I'm like, okay, how, how do I pick shifts? And they're like, okay, well, you gotta you know, look at the Google Calendar, see what matches up in your schedule. I'm like, great, is there like hours? There is no explanation. <laughs> that was my training, and it makes sense that in that year, we had 20 people join the events team, and within six months, there was only like three people left. <laughs> so, you know, it made, it, I started connecting the dots as years went on, like, oh, we need an actual training. Right, imagine your first Cutco training when you first showed up to your first day and your manager just gave you the manual and said, go make some phone calls now. <laughs> How would that go? Right? It'd be awful. So in 2021, I actually reached out to Dante. So big shout out to Dante. Honestly, we have Dante fans in the room? Woo! All right. So find the master, follow the model. That's been my biggest motto since I started in this company. And who 
what better person to ask than Dante Reynolds? So I reached out to Dante in March of 2021. I said, look, how are you recruiting and developing and training so many just, just people on your events team? Uh, he sat me down and he just like laid out the entire timeline. And this is before I was a coordinator, I was still an assistant coordinator and I wanted to start creating that kind of change. So I reached out to Dante, showed me the whole timeline and we started implementing that that very same year. And I have some stats for you guys actually. In 2019, so this is before we had any kind of tr official training, the training was still my cell, like just what I mentioned earlier. Before training, we sold $369,000 for non-key events, so events that a lot of newer reps will work. Uh, we did 170 events. We had a little bit over 1,000 orders, so we had around a $350 average order. In summer 2021, we implemented training for the very first time. Right? And in 2023, last year, for our traditional events, which again are worked by a majority of our JV or freshman reps, the lower tier reps, and they sold close to $800,000. That's 35%, by the way, of our traditional event sales. That's 106, we did 163 events last year in that traditional event category and non-key event category over 1,388 orders and a $580 average order. And that's a culmination of two years. And right now we currently have 18 top tier members, so varsity and elite, which you'll know those terms in a second, and 18 JV and freshman members, which we have a total of 36 people on our team. Right? Train your people, they're the future events team members. Right? And I was looking back at the stats of our whole team right now, and I didn't know this, but before I started, between 2013 and 2017, at our events team, we promoted one person to CSP. Only one in those four years. Between 2017 and 2021, we promoted three people, one of them being me. And then 2021 to 2024, so when we implemented training, we've now promoted nine CSPs straight from the events team uh, that started in one of those training classes as well, too. So, and I have some stats here too. Those nine CSPs last year, this is only in their event sales, so service events, malls, and traditional events. We had John Keneally sell 143,000. We had Roman Earhart sell, sell 83,000. Stacey Adams, 129. Jerry, 90 grand. Adam Jeffrey, 114. Mac, 48 grand. Kristen, 61. Riley, 31. Matt Fernandez, 10 grand. <laughs> And then all nine stemmed from all the events training that we implemented in 2021. That's 709,000 CPO from service events, traditional events, malls, all of it, right? And I believe the training, the quality of training is what matters, right? So for me, for example, in that first training, when I asked Dante what to do, he does two training sessions, one in January and one in August. And in August, after SC2, that's when we sat down and Exactly like this room here, you have 20 people, 30 people, that you do a full day of training. And I run that every single year, right after FC2, right after limo night, right after Fogo de Chao, when you don't get home till 1 a.m. So, <laughs> but I'm there, bright and early, because I know how important it is to receive a quality training. Right? That's my goal when I show up to every single training, every single talk, when I'm recruiting and training, because all I can think of is one person in this room can be the next Josh Muller. Right, one person, so I'm gonna show up and give my absolute best, right? No matter how late I stay up, right? So the questions you should be asking yourself are these ones right here, like how are you currently training your new guys? What is your current system you have in place to train them? What systemized scripts do you use? Are you auditing them? Do you edit them or do you just do a script that you've had for seven years and you're like, all right, this is good enough, right? Matt and I, we constantly look at the scripts to make sure that it's up to our standards and we change them if need be. Right? How far ahead are you thinking? I'm thinking five, 10 years in the future of where our future CSPs will be. Right? Because we might not have our top veterans, they might not be around anymore. Right? They might retire, they might do another business, who knows? Like our goal is to retain them, but at the end of the day, it's their choice. And so I wanna make sure we have a strong foundation of people ready to go to step in to be the next Josh, Jason, Matt, Sean, whoever. 
right? So the quality of training is important. What systems do you use to continue the development of 15 to 50K reps, 50 to 150K reps, 150K and beyond, right? So I won't dive in too much into training, but the timeline for me usually goes from March all the way to August is like my heavy recruiting timeline. March, I meet with my DVM. I review the previous year results. I show projections for our current year. I go over timeline, I go over dates, I go over, all right, I'm covering this in SC1, FOSS is covering this in SC2, and we just go over every single timeline to make sure that everybody's on the same page. In April, we meet with the DMs. May through July, that's when I attend all the talks, all the conferences, right, give messages, have my booth set up, all that stuff, and then August, I run my summer training. That's my heaviest, heaviest recruiting uh, four months. Right. All while still selling, of course, and going after big goals for SC2. Right. So what are your systems and what scripts do you use? And then the third second thing is focusing on skill set, which Matt's going to be talking more about here. Sweet. So I've been thinking about a concept recently of uh, two schools of thought when it comes to growth, and that's more and that's better. Right? So the first one I'll talk about here is better. So there's gonna come a time, guys, where events just get maxed out as far as reps and booths. And that's when you absolutely have to dive into skill set. When you guys think about it, there's only so many people you're gonna be able to see in a day at a service event. There's only gonna be so many booths that you can put in an arena for a home show, right? So I typically like to focus on maxing out the capacity first and focusing on our skill set after that. But there's no reason we can't continue to make our people cut co sales assassins every single chance that we get. So I ran some stats. Our team's average order between malls, traditional events, and service events last year was 637. Uh, we came in number three behind South Coast at 680 and LA at 688. Shout out to Matt and Brandon, you guys are animals. Um, but I think there's a few ways to increase the average order of the team. Number one is drill for skill. Uh, every single meeting that we have, there's some form of role play or live role play where we put people on the hot seat and they can't, they're can't. they not only able to sharpen their skill sets, but everyone can watch them and pick up on a line or two. Um, pretty sure Alan got this idea from Brandon, but we have two teammates do a live demo where the other teammates who act as the customers in the rest of the room already knows what their objections are going to be and how the scenario is supposed to play out. Um, what this does is it keeps everybody on their toes on the team because nobody knows who's going to be the next person to be in the hot seat, right? And, uh, and it also it kind of uh, allows people to learn from them. So, uh, But anyways, yeah, if people blow the hot seat, we basically shame them into oblivion. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so the other thing that, uh, that it allows the rep in the hot seat to get some really solid feedback, like positive and negative feedback from some of our elite members that they just normally would never get an opportunity to get. Um, so most of the reps, um, since we've been doing this, like that have been in the hot seat during our, uh, our, our team meetings, have grown significantly after that experience. Like it's noticeable. Um, this also gives the rest of the team the opportunity to either pick up on something new that they want to utilize in their scripts or just something that they noticed in that person's script that they might be forgetting to do. I say this all the time, but the best reps in the country aren't always doing something crazy new and unheard of, unless you're Jason. Jason's always on some crazy stuff. But uh, they're, they're remembering to do the things that we already know and execute with excellence, right? So. Number two is scripts in focus. Uh, Jason and I constructed a uh, new customer script with a mixture of kind of Jason's stuff and Curtis's stuff probably about four or five years ago, and that's been working great for us. And Al and I are excited to come out of this meeting and continue to revamp our scripts a bit. It's basically a triple close with a few plugs for the rest of the kitchen as well for the easy to follow. Um, we have a past customer ultimate upgrade script that uh, Jason Jeffrey created for us as well that we've been using for quite some time. And lastly, we have a walk around and think about an objection script from Luke. Um, those are our three main scripts. So one of our core rules of our team is memorizing your scripts. We make it mandatory to be on the team and between putting people in the hot seat and Alan keeping the newer guys accountable on the monthly meetings, which had been a game changer, to have these scripts down, everybody's on the same page. 
And uh, I'm not afraid to tell the newer guys, if you don't memorize your scripts, you're going to lose money in the program and you're going to have a bad time, okay? So, uh, however, if you do memorize your scripts, you can read that thing like an absolute robot, not have a communication bone in your body, which FYI is how I started, and you can still sell and be successful with the program. So... The other thing is for our displays, um, we don't, most of us don't have display boards out, we kind of, and we keep kind of a package focus. Some of our guys will maybe do one display board. I think it's, a, and there's different schools of thought on that, I understand, but I think it's important to have uh, some knives out, even if it's just business gifts, so people are more attracted to the booth. But as, as a team, what I'm trying to get across is we just have a huge emphasis on sets and packages with our customers, and it's always interesting because whenever the newer guys come and field train with a lot of our, our vets, one of the first things they pick up on is how much we shy away from promoting individual items as much as possible. So that's ingrained in the whole organization. So I think it's really key to let your team uh, see through stats too, how much sets and packages move the needle, not just for an entire shift, but sometimes an entire weekend or an entire show, uh, right? So number three here is sharing best practices and having great messages on, on uh, skill set at meetings. Um, a lot of you guys in this room, by the way, have spoken to our team at some point, and um, I, and I, I can't thank y'all enough for that. The reason we have we do we have this community together is so we can learn from each other and lean on each other, right? Um, we're super blessed to have Luke Mills um, as our training consultant for the team. He helps with key event prep calls and gives a message at every meeting that we have. Um, guys, we really pride ourselves on going the extra mile to dial in some really good speakers at our meetings and identify what the team needs to be better at. Like, I'm sorry guys, but the YouTube video on Grant Cardone just is not going to cut it. Like full transparency, I'm not the stats guy typically, but I know one of the most important metrics that you can measure is where your team excels and struggles in their current skill set at the booth. For example, like our team is really good at selling ultimates and ultimate upgrades. Um, of course, we aren't perfect, we're continuing to learn, but that's something we don't feel like we need to focus on at the moment. However, we're absolute crap at business gifts. We understand that. And so this year, most of our speakers and our focus is going to be tailored completely around business gifts. Um, so we're gonna be unrolling a bounty program around it, sharing best practices, promoting it on the group me when people get business gift orders. So. And just remind your team that regardless of how high their averages are, there's always someone out there with a better skill set that you should be learning from, right? Our training calls before Maricopa Home Show, we actually do a round robin on what has been working for everyone lately in their business, helping them sell more. Um, and, you know, kind of diving in on what we can implement for the coming home show, right? And we're excited to try and break another record here in a few weeks. So um, our vision for our team is to be one of the most talented local teams in the country. And the more we focus on creating a culture around that, the more it comes to fruition. Um, we make sure to lean on the best reps on our team to be innovating and teaching consistently um, and we make it a core value of ours to just be ridiculously good at what we do. So the more you know your team and what motivates them too, you can tailor your pitch to getting better um, to that as well. Like we, we understand Rising Sun has more families than most teams. Um, if we can promote growing your average order to create more efficiency in the time that they do work, they can feel really good about the time they're spending with their family, knowing they're maximizing the opportunities that they have, right? So this is also going to be huge for getting your people to work locally, because if they have a skill set to go out and sell five to 10K at a smaller show, they don't feel like they have to travel all around the country or the world to generate the same amount of profit. So one thing I love that Texoma did um, last year, and I think they're still doing this year, is they did a bounty for their team for beating the record for an event. Super cool. Got people excited to go to every event with a focus on growth. And of course, everyone likes to be the one saying that they crushed the event and broke the record. So you don't have to have a bounty, but over the last few years, we've just been promoting this for us. It's been huge. And I love getting, I love nothing more than getting the text from one of our team members asking, hey, what's the record for this event that they have coming up that weekend? Because I know it's about to happen. So. Yeah, we always promote the records at our events team. It's like, oh, Matt just broke the record, John just broke the record, and we just love seeing just people excited about that, too. Um, so the third thing is identifying the top 20% of your key events. Uh, show of hands, who here knows what the Pareto principle is? A couple of you. 
Yes. So that states that 80% of consequences come from 20% of causes. And over the years, it's now 80% of your sales will come from the top 20% of your clients. Well, for us, 80% of your sales will come from your top 20% of your events. Right? Your key events are the fruit of your team. Look for ways to grow it consistently. But you can't grow something if you don't know what you're growing. Right? The first key is to identify what your top 20% of events are. For us as a team, right, we literally sat down before we created our whole system what all our events are, what the CPOs produce over the past like three, four, five years for each series, every single one of these. And we started like labeling, okay, these are our elite events. These are our key events. These are our non-key events, right? And our goal is like, let's look at the top 20, these like elite ones and see how can we grow these? And every year now, Matt and I actually sit down and download all of our event sales that we produce and we analyze every single one of them. Right, but we focus on those elite events, right? Specifically, you know, if you guys know Maricopa is one of our biggest shows, right? That's been our biggest project. Like our goal, our mission is to make it a million dollar event over the course of those five events, right? So that we're focusing on that. We're asking ourselves, how can we grow this, right? We analyze it. Um, what's great, guys, is like the bottom, like I'm not saying get rid of the lower 80%, I don't even focus on them, but if you're focusing on the skill development of your lower reps, your JV, your freshman, whatever you call them, right, it's going to get taken care of because you're focusing on shift average, you're focusing on the event average of them, you're providing quality training. So when they show up to those events, they're going to crush it. Right? It's the same thing. But it's our job as coordinators to see how can we take these top events and make them grow further. Right. What are the strategies? And for the criteria that we use to identify these top 20 events, we look at the CPO that it's produced, the number of orders, who's the promoter that works, you know, that manages this event, and how long we've worked it, and any other notes that might come up that you know, affect our decisions when it comes to these kind of things. When we identify these, we start tracking these numbers, we can start seeing growth to come from it. Right. And again, like our focus for Maricopa, for all of our elite events, is to figure out how can we grow these things to a higher level. Uh, and Matt here, actually, one of the key things for this is expanding through more booths and more shifts that Matt's going to talk about, because this is like baby child for this. <laughs> so this is where I get to talk about the second school of thought, which is more. And I, I, this honestly has been our biggest focus as coordinators the last year or two, and we feel like we've really pushed the envelope on what's possible at our events with staffing. And here's the thing, we let the team know up front that we're gonna be really aggressive about maximizing our events for a year or two. That might mean we have an extra booth or an extra shift that maybe didn't need to be there, but we can't know what the ceiling is until we hit it. And in order to grow, we have to push the limits until we hit a point of diminishing returns. Um, Alan and I view one of our most important jobs is creating more opportunity for the team, and this is one of the best ways to do it. So number one thing here is gonna be analyzing the data for your key events and your crown jewel or elite events, right? Um, order count at events will tell you a lot about what's possible. If someone's getting 15, 20 orders in a day at an event, it's probably an indication that we could use another person since there were probably some customers that got missed. Of course, guys, you might get some pushback from the person who's worked it consistently for the last seven years by themselves or the team, but if you allow that to dictate your decisions and you don't go based on the facts, your events won't grow. That's why it's important to have a system in place where you can track your events by orders per day. Got to be able to track your events by orders per day. When your team sees over the course of time that you're actually looking at the numbers and making decisions based on those facts, they're actually going to develop more trust in your decisions to staff more people or add more boosts. So, Another key is actually getting feedback from your team. In our event stack collection, we have a notes section where they can comment on the traffic of the event and what the staffing was like, right? Um, people want to be heard and they want to know that their feedback is valuable. And this is a perfect way to make them feel heard. We also have a new role in our team where our qualification manager, before they negotiate an event, will check in with the team member who worked at the previous year just to like get a quick phone call, like two minute phone call with them about their feedback. This way we can hear directly from them on their thoughts, their feelings about the events, if they forgot to make a note or they were just really brief in their notes, right? 
So Alan and I are, are very intentional about asking everyone who worked one of our top events how they think it went and how the staffing was because um, we're always growing and evolving and changing things. So it's, it's the same thing with the amount of booths. Um, the results for each booth will tell you a story. And if every single booth at a large event produces similar orders and sales, it might be time to try another one. Um, this can also let you know if you have too many booths and the first few might be cannibalizing sales for the others. I'll give you guys a great example. Maricopa Home Show in July and February last year broke the record. We had a 40K booth, 40K booth, 40K booth, 55K booth, right? All four of those did great. So obviously I was like, let's add a fifth booth and see how it does. Problem was uh, the J the July Maricopa Home Show is at the same exact venue and it usually has very similar traffic. So I put five booths there, and unfortunately, with the first booth, which was our entrance tent, and the first booth cannibalized sales for the whole rest of them. So yeah, we made a mistake. We put five booths at that event, and that was way too much. Now we kind of know our limits, though, right? But we it, we have to continue to expand and push until we figure out what each event looks like. So you know, now we're narrowing back to about four booths, and we removed out the entrance tent, so that way everything gets spread out a little bit more, right? But we actually uh, make it a point to really look at that that stuff. Um, so. Um, I challenge you guys to really dive into the stats on your best events. And again, numbers tell a story. Numbers tell a story. Use them to make educated decisions on, the ex on that expansion um, and the opportunity at that show. Uh, number two, just creating more opportunity. Everyone wants to work our top events, obviously. Even if it's a booth that's a little bit lower on the totem pole as far as the results go, a lot of your team will be excited just to be there and generate sales that they wouldn't have had. Um, I learned this working the Wisconsin State Fair. I don't know how many, you know, dozens of booths they have there now, but it was great. Um, but people were excited. A lower performing booth at your top event might still generate more sales than a smaller local event that weekend, so people will want to work it. Everyone in this room has heard at one point from their people that they want to work more shows. Um, our philosophy as coordinators is that there's somebody on our team that wants to work and keep their schedule full or work every weekend. There's no reason we shouldn't be able to find something for them. No reason. So adding more booths is such a game changer because it opens up a whole weekend for someone to work if one of our vet reps decides to be at a new booth at our top event rather than a small key one that opens up some of those mid-tier, some of those mid-tier new guys to work to work that event. So um, we tell the team that if they want to work a weekend and there isn't anything on their schedule, come and talk to us directly and we will find them something, whether it's a pop-up at the mall like Nick talked about, right, or a service event, or we just find a, a smaller local event. Um, but uh, Texoma last year did an amazing job with promoting uh, weekend-long solo service events in saturated areas um, that reps could know they could fill their schedule up with so they could be in the field that weekend. Um, the more booths that we have, though, the more people feel like there's opportunity for them, and the more people feel like there's opportunity, the longer they're going to stick around and the more they're going to sell. Um, so obviously this has to be worth the reps time, depending on where they're at in the business. Um, but we think one of the most underutilized areas to grow sales is small local events. And you guys know, I preach and harp on this all the time, but a lot of the top guys on your teams don't realize that a with where their skill set is at the moment and how the brand recognition of Cutco has just exploded over the years that they could go work a small local event that did a grand or two in the past and probably sell six K plus at it. And trust me, that CPO really adds up over the course of the year. So we almost promote it as a challenge too for our top guys to go into a smaller event that has potential and show people what's possible. Go show us what's possible. It feeds their ego and it reframes their mindset on what's possible now at those kinds of events. Um, I'm not saying that there aren't shows that aren't worth working out there um, or that there's absolutely no limit to what, how many boosts you can put at an event. Of course there is. But a lot of reps and coordinators, I think, just think too small. Um, when it comes to adding more shifts, um, this was a huge area of opportunity for our team because we worked a lot of two-person events uh, solo. Um, so adding a second person allows us to get that overflow, which is inevitably going to happen regardless of the rep that's working it. Um, even if it was just for two, three hours during the day that the booth got slammed and both people were closing sets at those busy times, it made it work it. I remember I worked a, a slower show up in Flagstaff that was new with Adam 
Jeffrey, and it was pretty slow most of the days where there was a three-day event. But the one day that was busy, we had probably a three, four-hour period that him and I closed, you know, seven or eight grand out of the 14 grand that we sold that weekend in that, like, two, three hours, like, closing ultimates and stuff at the same time. Like, that's why we have two people at events. So the also the benefit of more shifts is it gives people an opportunity to work together and build their professional relationship. And so many times learning from each other as well. It's just great for culture when people have the ability to work alongside uh, their coworkers. Um, and also work towards a common goal of breaking that event record. Um, and it helps the new guys with their learning curve as well. If you get a mid-tier, lower-tier rep paired up with a vet rep. So you're also going to start to learn who works well together and who doesn't. And for certain events that get staffed, you can take that into consideration. Um, growing events is a constant process of trial and error, though. And you, you have to commit to it, and you got to see it through. Creating more opportunity, obviously, isn't always a clean process. But if you play scared, you can't grow. That's why I love this quote, abundance is not something we acquire, it is something we tune into. So expand your boots and expand your shifts. All right, so shift average. I think for me this was one of the biggest needle movers for our division uh, back in 2021. All right, so again, we were focusing on, okay, how do we maximize our current key events by staffing our actual best people. Now the best people, it doesn't just mean that they sell the most in sales. We're like, well, what are they doing at the actual booth? Like what are they selling right, when they're working their shift? So with this, we began to realize that one of the biggest influences we can have in our yearly sales as an events team is our current events that we're working. So what we did is one, we revamped our training program, of course, in 2021, uh, and then we did a couple of a, a, a couple other changes as well with our team. And then the last thing that we did was, okay, we need to like revamp the whole picking order, picking tier system that we've had for 12 years, right? So I sat down with, uh, you know, Jason actually, the coordinator when I was assistant coordinator, and I introduced this concept to him about we need to refocus our shift average because right now what was happening is we had people hitting their, their milestones because at the time to get to the higher level of picking shifts and events, all you had to do was reach a certain career, career sales milestone and that was it. Right? You were at a million dollars in career sales, perfect, you're in the very top. And it didn't really take into account of people that are honing their craft, their skills at the booth. So we needed to redo our whole picking process for this. And we wanted, we wanted to create a better reward system for reps who are A, actively a part of the events team, right? And they're not just showing up just to show up, but they are there. They're contributing, they're attending meetings in person uh, compared to people who aren't attending at all and still getting quality shifts. And we wanted to make sure that it's focusing on shift average, right? So the old system, like I mentioned, was just the tier placement was just based off of what you sold since the last meeting and what your career sales were. Those were the two qualifying factors on what determined your picking order, was career sales and what you sold since last meeting, right? And we saw in 2019, when we had the system in place, we sold 1.6 million, and we were just you know sitting around there for so many years before that as well. So in 2021, it's funny, because I literally sat down at a random event that was just slow, and I was just like, I am gonna just create this from scratch. And so I literally just created a whole different tier system, different averages, things like that. And we created four levels. We created the freshman team, right, which is the recruits, the JV, varsity, and elite. Those are the four things. Now, when you get to varsity and elite, you'll notice focusing on shift average. So maintaining a rising sun division key shift average of 38.50, or 2250 in traditional events. Traditional events mean non-key events from the previous year. Uh, varsity, maintaining a rising sun division key shift average of 2500 plus, or a standard shift average of 1200 plus from the previous 12 months. Right, so those are our focuses. That's the first requirement. Now there's a lot more requirements that go into place, and it's funny that as people rise through the ranks, as they go from freshman to JV, from JV to varsity, from varsity to elite, the standards rise as well. It's harder to get into elite than it is to obviously get into JV. And our reason for this was because we wanted to make sure that the people who are elite, that are picking the best shifts, picking the best events, right, that they're meeting those requirements, that this is a full-time business for them. They're not doing this part-time, Right, they are CEOs, hence why their standards are a lot higher. 
For example, we did, again, last 12 months shift average. We did career sales. Uh, what you sold in the past 12 months. Uh, did you purchase your whole booth display kit as well? Uh, number of service events, business plan submission for our elite members, meeting attendance. We now added marketing requirements too if you're an elite or varsity member. Uh, so all those things just determine your status on whether you're elite, varsity, JV, or freshman, right? Now picking order, this is the, the biggest thing that we were figuring out how to focus more on shift average because not every event is weighted equally, as you guys know. Uh, and it would cause a shift if people were like, well, I'm just gonna be picking the best events so my shift average is the highest. So what we did is we actually looked at a variety of people over the past years, back in 2021, different levels. So we looked at like Luke, we looked at myself at the time, we looked at Jason, we looked at a couple other people. And we're like, okay, what did they sell in key events? And what did they sell in non-key events? We figured out their averages over the span of those three years. And then what we found was that on average, if you took the, like all those reps averages, they would sell 2.6 times more at a key event than a non-key event, right? So we didn't want people just focusing on key events. So what we did is we added a multiplier on the traditional events of 2.6. And the weighted average equation that we use, and this is the only math part, so sorry guys, this is the only math part that we use to find the weighted average is we take what they sold for key events, total CPO, and then we add the non-key event total CPO with, a, with that 2.6 multiplier, and we divide by the total number of shifts they worked. And that gets us their weighted average between traditional and uh, key events, or non-key non events and key events. Right, so this helps us because now we're able, now people are like, okay, well, I can work this key event, it's great, but there's people out there that are working traditional events and crushing it. And now they're getting a 2.6 multiplier, and that's great because that's, that's the incentive all along. If someone's crushing non-key events, that's good. Right, that's a good thing. Right, so now it's like, now you're debating, now reps are debating whether, okay, well, do I wanna just take all the best events or do I wanna try and work those smaller events so I can get that multiplier? And that's helped a ton with our average. And just so you guys can see what I mean by this, in 2021, we sold 1.6 million. Right, we sold 1.2 million in that fall, right when we introduced that concept in August. Right, we introduced the concept in August. We said we're gonna be implementing this in January of 2022. So everything you sell from this fall campaign is gonna count for January 2022 for your, way, for your averages. And so everyone started focusing on averages and we sold 1.2 million in that fall. All right, 2022, first full year with this program, right? So that's our first full year with this new system, right? Everything, we sold 3.2 million. Right? And it wasn't a perfect system actually, right? But we hashed it out, we worked on it to better. Uh, you know, for our reps, you know, a good quick story just so you guys can see to show you that A, we're constantly listening and taking uh, opinions from our reps to see if it'll better our system. And one of our reps was like, hey, I love this system because it's allowing me to focus on my average. However, I feel like I'm, wor I'm working so many events and some of those events aren't going as great and now I'm being penalized because I want to work more events. And so we listen to that and we're like, oh, we need more criteria to determine the actual picking order. So that's what you guys see on the far right over there is that those three different criteria that we now currently use. I won't get into the you know, nitty gritty of like what the math looks like. If you guys want the spreadsheet, I can send it to you. Essentially, it's like a golf score kind of thing. But 40% um, of their picking order is determined on their weighted average. 40% is determined on their booth sales from the division, right? Not if they travel to, you know, anywhere else, but from the division. So sorry, Matt, your State Fair of Texas sales won't count for Rising Sun. Uh, <laughs> and 20% counts from the last 12 months sales, right? So we decided to go with that direction because now it gives uh, a more unbiased opinion of what that rep's, you know, skill level is at as a whole, as a CSP as a whole. And we find this has worked a lot better. We just implemented this in 2023, or sorry, 2024, so literally January, uh, and we think this is gonna help a lot more. So 2022, we sold 3.2, and 2023, we sold 3.3. So the question you should ask yourself for your team, if your averages aren't where you want them to be, 
What are you doing to bring awareness to it? Right? If you want your averages to grow, you gotta first start by talking about those averages to your events team. Cool. And lastly, delegation and leadership. This is our secret sauce. So I love how Alan's so smart, he just sits down at, a, at an event and he was bored and came up with the best shift picking system we've had in 12 years. So yeah, that's great. Um, and how are we doing on time, by the way? Okay, cool. Um, well, I'm going to skip over this section because it doesn't have a ton to do with um, shift average. just kind of a bonus thing. But I, I will wrap this up with you guys for you guys with a couple of key points here. Um, so here's the thing, guys. If you're going to focus on anything to grow your events this year, um, number one, focus on training and development from the ground up. Um, guys, your, your new guys need more time and attention to develop and retain them than you think. So go the extra mile for those guys and you're gonna have a deep bench before you know it. Give them the best scripts and the best training you can right out of the gate and find a way to make it you know, palatable for them to learn and integrate as quickly as possible. Guys, the best coordinators are thinking decades over days. So are you trying to have a great team this year or for years to come? Consistent development at every single level, like Nick talked about, is one of the best ways to make sure you're maxing out your team's opportunity. So start to ask yourself, guys, what does each tier and level of development on my team look like and what systems do I have in place to bring them to the next level, right? Number two, focus on constant skill set and development. Um, as Brian Carter always says, we're not entitled to growth. I've heard him say that probably a million times. Uh, it's your job as a coordinator to provide the training and content necessary for your team to grow. Yes, you should encourage mentors. Yes, you should bring them to net. But there's so much more that you can be doing throughout the course of the year to help people be the best they can be at selling Cutco. So what time do you have set aside in your calendar to grow and develop the people in your organization? And then number three, last thing is focus on shift average. Uh, shift average is the golden metric for growth of your people, your events, and your program all together. Uh, your average order is awesome, guys, but if you're only taking two orders a day, I don't care how good it is. So put the systems of accountability in place to make sure that people know where they are at with this and reward people based on their performance and effort. Right, And lastly, a bonus tip for you guys, just develop more badass leaders on your team. It's, you won't regret it. What makes Rising Sun the team we are and what our X factor is, is the leaders we have in the booth and out of it. We would be nothing without the leadership team that we have and the key players in our organization that are intelligent, motivated, and care enough to move the needle in every area of our team. Uh, if you've ever read a book called The 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership by John Maxwell, he stakes the law of explosive growth. Good leaders add more followers and grow by addition, while great leaders add more leaders and grow by multiplication. It's called leader's math. So followers attract more followers to get the job done, whereas leaders attract and develop more leaders and followers to get the job done and continue developing everyone in the organization. So how much focus do you have on developing leaders within your show team, not just to have explosive growth in 2024, but for the next decade? As coordinators, how can we continue to make our teams and this program the sexiest opportunity in all of Cutco, where people have an abundance of event opportunity, personal and professional growth consistently, and a tribe that they can see themselves working with for the next decade or two? In the words of Simon Sinek, leadership is not about being in charge, but taking care of the people in our charge. So my prayer for everyone in this room is that we continue to push the boundaries of what's possible and serve the people in our charge the best way that we can. Leaders lead and the future is in literally every single one of your hands. So thank you guys for your time. God bless. Have an amazing 2024 and let's go out and crush it.